It's been only two months since we hit 1000 subscribers and we already get to celebrate another milestone. <laughs> you people are amazing, I swear. <laughs> okay, so, in order to properly thank you for having reached 2000 subscribers, I decided to make another tier list. This time, we'll be tackling one of the most recognizable qualities that enrich the Yakuza series, those being the beautiful Irazumi pieces by the legendary artist Horitomo. Prior to really getting into the series, I was generally against tattoos that featured any kind of color aside from black, but thanks to his work in Ryuga Gotoku, I've developed quite an appreciation for the artistry that can be achieved with a wider palette. You'll also notice how I've labeled the video as the Yakuza Tattoos tier list, so I think it's best to first clarify why I won't actually refer to the pieces as quote-unquote tattoos during this discussion. In the words of a real-life Yakuza member who did an interview with the Anime Man, tattoos are something that is meant to be shown off. Irezumi, on the other hand, are meant to be hidden. I guess our boys in Like a Dragon didn't really get the memo, huh? Beyond the different intention behind the actual pieces, there are also different techniques involved in making the art. But we won't get into that right now. Just thought I should point it out before we begin, since people may not be familiar with the other term. So. Here we have a total of 22 pieces that were featured from Yakuza 1 all the way to Yakuza 7. There are evidently some pieces missing, like for example Yumi's flower from Yakuza 1 and even Oba's back piece from Kurohyo 2. But for the purposes of this video, we'll stick to what is presented here. This will be an entirely subjective tier list and I'll rank the pieces based on a combination of several criteria. The most important one will be the general aesthetic preference so how much I like it as an art piece in general. Secondly, I'll take into account how well those pieces initially represented the characters that carried them, and finally, seeing if the resolution of their respective character arcs made the Irazumi more memorable than it was upon its introduction. Since discussing Irazumi in such a way will inevitably lead to massive spoilers, we'll be analyzing them in release order, and I'll put the timestamps for each segment in the top comment. There will also be a link to the actual tier list itself, so you can try to rank them for yourselves. Also, to any native Japanese speakers among you, I would like to thoroughly apologize for any mispronunciations I may make in the video. So, without further ado, let's start with the pieces from Yakuza 1. First up, we have Kiryu's iconic dragon piece. S tier, right off the bat. The importance of this one piece cannot be overstated. It's the first dragon piece of the series, which set a blueprint for several other Irazumi, as you can see from the other entries. It is arguably as iconic to the series as Kiryu himself, and perfectly encapsulates his overwhelming strength, coupled with a serene nature. One of the main things you'll notice when analyzing Irazumi is that there aren't too many different colors utilized. All of them are natural, and each color has a different meaning depending on its prominence in a piece. Beyond that, the number of fingers a dragon bears can also indicate how strong they are, while the direction the dragon is pointed towards is further indicative of the bearer's nature. In Kiryu's case, we can tell that he's an incredibly powerful person who uses his strength to protect those around him and eventually lead them to prosperity, intentionally or not. That is his true nature, even if it may cost him his own prosperity in the end as we've seen with the amount of tragedy that has befallen him and the people he cares for. It's a tragic yet beautiful portrayal of a legendary character, a perfect starting point for a lengthy series. Alright, next up, we have Shimano's Irezumi, a tiger. The meaning behind it is rather simple. It symbolizes strength and aggression, a perfect fit for such a straightforward character. According to a set of posts that you can find on Tumblr of all places, a tiger is said to be equal in strength to a dragon, so it makes for a nice parallel for the first high-ranking Yakuza we get to fight. Aesthetically, it looks pretty cool as well, since it served as the first piece in the series that would show off an expanded design that covers the sleeves and chest of its bearer as well, which makes a further distinction between the old guard and the newcomers to the Yakuza lifestyle. For now, I'll put it in B tier, because we have a lot of amazing pieces to go through with even more depth to them. Next up, we have the most badass fish ever to have graced this series. The Red Koi, pridefully worn by the one and only Nishikiyama. 
The story behind the koi is that if the creature manages to swim up a violent upstream river and pass through the tori gates at the end, it will manage to become a dragon. Personally, I've first heard of this story from the band Trivium, as their singer is half Japanese and also has some amazing pieces based on Japanese mythos on his back. Back to the fish of the hour, I remember many people asking why Nishiki would even get a koi instead of just going for a dragon, if that is his end goal. And the simplest answer to that is that Irezumi have to be earned. It's not like you can just go to an artist and threaten them into giving you a dragon, because these pieces are genuine representations of the person bearing them. There is a strong spiritual element to them that can't be explained so easily. I could even imagine a Yakuza being struck by lightning or shot on sight if they disobey these divine laws of nature. I know that sounds strange to us outsiders, but this whole lifestyle is built upon such laws, and it is what partially led to the prosperity of the underworld in the Yakuza series. So, Nishiki getting a koi might be interpreted as him being fated to never surpass Kiryu, or even symbolizing how this constant pursuit of power would bring him nothing in the end, even if he bested his best friend. He'd still be that koi, but the river he swam up would seemingly run dry. It's like Nishiki said in Yakuza 0, he's nothing without Kiryu. And this is the most perfect representation for such a complex character like Nishiki, Estir. We have now arrived at Yakuza 2, and the first entry here might surprise you. The Hanya piece belonging to the timeless icon that is Goro Majima is one the whole community is fairly familiar with. So you might ask why I didn't cover it in the Yakuza 1 portion of the video. After all, Majima was in that game as well. Well, funnily enough, he never showed his back piece in the first game, and the actual design wasn't even finalized during its development. Taking all of that into account, we finally get to see it in its entirety in Yakuza 2, and it's an impeccable choice to represent Majima. The Hanya is a female demon representing a scorned lover. What's amazing about the design of Hanya masks in particular is that, depending on the corner from which they are observed, the facial expression will change. It can either show a malicious grin or signs of tearful sorrow. Even before the context we would get for Majima's backstory in Yakuza 4, 5 and 0, it was evident that he was a deeply conflicted person. Even going back to Yakuza 1, you never knew which side of him you would wind up with. And the more we've seen of him, the more weight did this Irizumi carry. Once again, a perfect piece, S-tier. Up next, we have the mighty Akala, an Irizumi carried by Daigo Dojima a central figure that calmly resides on his throne despite the flames surrounding it. The general interpretation of the Akala, or Fudomio, is that it's a king blessed with the gift of wisdom. Considering the role that Daigo would take on in Yakuza 2, this makes for some great foreshadowing of his role in the rest of the series. While he may have made some missteps along the way, he managed to truly earn his throne thanks to everything he'd learned over time. The fact that a dragon surrounds the sword in his hand is also a nice nod to how Kiryu helped him out many times until Daigo could finally stand on his own. While I'm not the biggest fan of the actual design, the narrative weight alone helps elevate this to a solid A tier. Plus, this is Daigo we're talking about, you can't really hate the guy. Ah, lo and behold, here we have the first rival dragon of the series. The golden piece belonging to the fan favorite villain, Goda Ryuji. We've already spoken about the symbolism of dragons, but this piece is equally important for the series moving forward as it sets up the precedent for the good old there can only be one dragon shtick. Some people love it, others absolutely hate it. Personally, I think the dragon motif has become a tad overused, even for a series with the word dragon in its name. While Ryuji thankfully got additional depth to his character through Dead Souls, his story in Ryuga Gotoku Online, and even indirectly through his Ishin counterpart, his actual depiction in Yakuza 2 relied too strongly on the direct premise of the dragon mythos. It can take away from the weight of his personal convictions when he decides to speak like a fortune teller. Having said that, he still handled it somewhat gracefully overall, and again, he was the first rival dragon of the series, so I still consider this an S tier. The piece is aesthetically menacing and gorgeous, and it fits Ryuji quite well. But at the same time, it also set up a questionable precedent for certain narrative choices moving forward. We'll get to that later. Now, we can move on to the pieces shown in Yakuza 3. 
First in line is the lovable Rikia and his snake. Uh, right, Viper. While the design may lead you to believe that Rikia is a villain, in tune with how he was first portrayed in the story, the Viper in question is actually a species native to Okinawa, and often seen as a protector. The entire Ryuda family is very vocal about their love for the town, and once you have a nice long talk with them, that hospitality extends to Kiryu and his orphanage too. A great use of an initially misleading design that gave us one of the most fondly remembered sidekicks in the series. Also, you know how you're not supposed to play with snakes, or you could risk getting poisoned and dying? Well, even after Rikia sadly passes away, his venom was seemingly inherited by Kiryu, and we all know what happened after that. Moral of the story, don't mess with snakes. Uh, right, sorry, my bad. <clears throat> the actual design is fairly simple, but it does stand out when compared to the other pieces here, so I'll give it an 8 here. Again, it's a matter of stylistic preference at this point, because the narrative weight is always there. Keeping with the native theme, here we have a Ryukyu iteration of a guardian lion. This lion is known as the Shisa, courtesy of Nakahara, who is the head of the Ryuda family. The creature in question can be found in numerous cities across Asia, but it's mainly associated with China. The Shisa is generally seen as a symbol of protection and good fortune. Again, solid representation for such a protective father figure. It's clear to see how Kiryu and him would see eye to eye so quickly. But as for the general design, while interesting, it doesn't hit me nearly as hard as many of the other pieces we'll discuss. So I'll put it in B tier for now. Okay, after two very wholesome entries, here comes a symbol of grace being tied to... Uh, well, well, let's just say that grace isn't the first word that comes to mind when I think of Kanda Tsuyoshi. Unless you also count that beach photo. Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. we're getting horrifyingly sidetracked. Okay, so, Kanda Zirazumi is that of a Tenyo, a figure normally associated with divine expressions and imagery. In this case, however, the depiction focuses more so on the primal parts of human expression. The figure is seen as a more seductive version of its originator, with the associated garb drawing heavy inspiration from courtesan fashion from the Edo period. It almost feels like a deliberately ironic connection that a being like that is tied to Kanda of all people, and taking into account the Irazumi parts beyond the actual back piece that may have very well been the actual intent. It showcases imagery that probably influenced many festival masks you can see during various celebrations in Japan, potentially pushing the observer not to take everything so seriously. But that's just a thought. It's a strange piece tied to a really strange character, so I'll put it in C tier. To conclude the segment on Yakuza 3, we have the legendary Kirin, and its embodiment, Sir Yoshitaka Mine. I've made a whole video on why I think Mine is one of the best villains in the series, and the imagery associated with his Irizumi has a lot to do with it. Without repeating myself too much, a Kirin is a being of incredible might, even surpassing that of a dragon, while adorning an equally frightening facade. Kirin are in fact made up of many different animals, but they're actually quite peaceful creatures who only appear at times of peace and prosperity as a result of an honorable ruler. Perfect fit, right? I went more in depth on how this Irizumi even influenced Mina's gameplay in the aforementioned video, so I'll just leave it at that for now. The imagery itself? Absolutely breathtaking. Easy S tier from me. We have now arrived at Yakuza 4, and the first Irizumi shown is yet another tiger, this time belonging to the appropriately named Saijima Taiga. I'm kind of mixed on this one. On first glance, this could even pass off as a western piece, as it misses the bright colorful nature usually enriching the background of such designs. Not only that, but considering what we've said about the tiger motif when discussing Shimano, this piece becomes a bit harder to analyze. If we would just look at Saijima's character from Yakuza 4 specifically, I could definitely see how that would be a perfect fit, but considering the drastic shift his character takes in Yakuza 5 onwards, the tiger just seems misleading. Sure, he has the physical strength tied to it, but the ferocious and violent nature is all but gone. The Saijima we see today is a calm and serene individual, after having reunited with Majima and meeting Kiryu. So the tiger, at least for me, now carries less weight in the actual characterization. 
Even aesthetically, it just feels like a less busy version of Shimano's tattoo, so I'll have to put it in C tier, sadly. Okay, this is a weird piece to discuss. If you didn't know, this seemingly out of place skull belongs to Minami of the Majima family. I honestly don't know what to say here. Beyond Minami's angelic voice, he just seems like an attempt to write a younger Majima, now that the one-eyed demon is seemingly out of steam in his quote-unquote old age. Well, at least that's the way that Yakuza 4 and 5 would frame it, but whatever. As entertaining as Minami's introduction was, it didn't lead to anything meaningful post Yakuza 4. Adding to that the fact that he has both western tattoos and proper Irezumi inked, it comes off as the actions of a young kid who doesn't know what he wants to do in life, so he just does everything at once. As much as I generally like skulls in art, and this even reminds me of an old Pantera shirt I own, it ultimately misses the mark for me. I'll put it in C tier because I genuinely think none of these pieces would ever deserve to go into D tier. Even at their worst, they're still a gorgeous sight to behold. Okay, it's time to take a look at the art behind Yakuza 5. First in line, with an Irezumi of an Ashura, is the legendary Masaru Watase. For how little we see of his character in Yakuza 5 in terms of sheer fighting prowess, I think they picked the right image for him. Ashura are demigods of war, whose sole purpose for living is violence and destruction. They are purely driven by strong negative emotions, which makes them hellish to contend with. Considering Watase's desire for an old-fashioned all-out war behind the Omi and the Tojo, along with a general desire to surpass literally everyone, we had the makings of a phenomenal final villain here, but evidently the final story took a different path. I do have a bit of a soft spot for the Ashura motif, considering its relevance in Kurohyo 2 and in the criminally underrated karaoke track Ashura Komachi from Ishin. With all of that said, I think I'll put it in A tier. As much as I love the attention to detail, it still doesn't strike me as being an iconic piece like the Irezumi I've placed in S tier. Plus, the treatment of Watase in 5's story does drag down the impact for me. I know it sounds weird, but if a character is meant to be an embodiment of the art on their back, then the final fight we had with Watase is probably the most counterintuitive way to fulfill that goal. He was really dealt a poor hand, but that's a story for another time. Up next, we have an Inazumi of a crane, heralded by the greatest actor in movie history, Katsuya. I'll just say this immediately, just looking at it from an aesthetic perspective, this is one of my all-time favorites. It's really unique and elegant, befitting the framing of Katsuya as this public figure with a squeaky clean image. As for the crane itself, it is known as a being with an incredibly lengthy lifespan, as well as being an emblem of prosperity. Considering Katsuya's role in the idol industry, as well as the fact he survived all of those never-ending monologues while suffering from a mortal wound atop a skyscraper, yeah, I'd say he could easily join Kiryu in a retirement home when they both turn 150. Anyway, much like with Watase, the mistreatment of the character leading up to the one encounter you have with them really leaves the soul on a sour note. I still think that this is some 8 tier art, I just wish it was given its time to shine in a meaningful way. These are gracious beings we're talking about after all, so they shouldn't just be cast aside for plot convenience. Let's see what's next on the... Damn it. Okay, to avoid this segment turning into a 3 hour rant, I'll just say that I have many, very many grievances with the story of Yakuza 5, all of which will probably be addressed at some point in the future. But Aizawa is probably the biggest issue I have with this narrative. He has a koi as his Irezumi, albeit in a different shade than Ishiki's, so the same symbolism applies, except it lacks the needed brevity. While he does appear to have a desire to rise through the ranks, the way he is portrayed in the story is filled with contradictions, and not in a way that can make for a good statement on some inner conflict or innate self-hatred. The Koi association here just feels like a last minute addition to add weight to a conflict generally bereft of it. I get that this rambling of mine feels disjointed, and that's because I can't really talk about the issues of Aizawa's characterization without deconstructing the narrative of Yakuza 5 as a whole, and by association I can't approach this ink in a way like I've done with the other entries either. So I'll just put it in B tier for now. I really love this aesthetic 
but any meaningful elaboration beyond that will have to wait until I inevitably tackle Five Story in the future. Anyway, let's move on to Yakuza 0. We have four Irezumi here, and the first one is Kuze's Enma. The first thing you can find out about the Enma's mythological background is that this being is a ruthless judge. Simple, but effective. With the number of times you face off against him, where the main sentiment that is reinforced is to stop being a half ass the imagery is justified, no pun intended. Until you prove to this judge that you have what it takes to be a real Yakuza, he'll just keep haunting you, and even though you've beaten him four times leading up to the final encounter, that last one really feels special. It's the final test you get before you're ready to take on the world. This tenacity arguably made Kuze a more fitting mentor figure to Kiryu than even Kazama in this game. I'm a tad mixed when it comes to the actual design of the Irezumi, but that's just a case of personal preference. This is an easy A tier, just barely missing out on S, cause I want the final rankings to be somewhat uniform from S to C rank. Anyway, great entry. Okay, now we have a bit of a weird one. As it turns out, this is an Irezumi belonging to Li Wenhai, and it depicts a Guan Yu. I must say, I was surprised when I saw that he has some old-fashioned ink, cause this imagery is mainly associated with the Gokudo lifestyle, and we rarely see members of the Chinese crime syndicates or even Korean members branding it. The aforementioned Guan Yu serves as a god of war in Chinese mythos, and according to another post made by the Tumblr user who went in-depth on all of the ink in Yakuza, it is tied to an interesting tale of saving a young girl from her assailants. Considering Lee's protective nature towards Makoto, this is a really nice touch. But if we're specifically talking about the general design, it's kind of odd. Definitely not in a bad way, it's just that I'm confused whenever I look at the color choices and the fact that this is so close to being what you'd expect from an Irezumi, but then not being that at the same time. I'm not the biggest fan of Lee as a character either, despite the similarities to Saijima, so that makes it even tougher to rank. You know what? I'll put it in B tier. I'm actually growing fonder of the design the more I look at it. We'll just see if that's still the case once I finish off this list. So, the next Irezumi that we have is that of a Momotaro, courtesy of Japan's biggest playboy, Awano. I've actually heard of the affiliations that Momotaro has to Peaches, because I did read about some Japanese mythos prior to doing this video. It's funny because the first half of this name, Momo, literally translates to Peach. Apparently, depending on the time frame that he was talked about, this figure could also be emblematic of a quote-unquote lazy hero. The lazy part definitely fits with Awano and how he gave up on fighting his way to the top, the way a Yakuza should. The more I look into this figure, the more it feels like everyone has their own take on the Momotaro myth usually very positive ones. As far as the actual Irezumi goes, it just doesn't really click with me. Can't explain it, but I prefer designs that are more ominous in nature, and this one just seems to reinforce the idea that Awana was actually one of the good guys all along. That makes his downfall of ideals that much more saddening, cause who knows what the world of Yakuza could have wound up as had he stayed with his convictions. Man, this is hard. <laughs> Alright, so... Since all of the Irezumi here tend to have an inherently strong narrative connection to their bearer, I might as well make it easier for me and just stick to the aesthetics here. So for now, I'll put it in a high C tier. I really didn't expect this to give me more trouble than the opening tier list. Okay, I'll try to do the rest of the list quicker. The final Irezumi in Yakuza 0, a dragon, riveting, okay. This time, this is Shibusawa's iteration. We've covered two dragons by now, and really, the only thing that I could add here is that this design is the most reminiscent of the dragon from Dragon Ball. Not that it's an inherently good or bad thing, it just felt like a subtle nod to Toriyama's art style, so that's cool. Story-wise, Shibusawa leans into the dragon-centric monologues a bit too hard, even when compared to Ryuji, cause he's basically declaring war on Kiryu for a nickname he could've earned by himself already. Hell, had it not been for the whole backstabby business with the empty lot, Kiryu wouldn't even have had to interact with them, which would then remove the whole need for this conflict over who would become the famed Dragon of Dojima at all. Even Shibusawa as a character never really felt that captivating to me. 
The way he's portrayed in the story wants to drive home the idea that he's this contemplative criminal mastermind puppeteering everyone around him. But I don't buy that for a second. I mean, looking at the way we handle the lieutenants in the story, it felt like Dojima just went with the villain of the week route with all of them. Okay, picture this. Kiryu is interfering with Dojima's plans, so Dojima decides to eliminate him. He sends Kuze to do the job, but Kuze loses. He then sends Awana after Kiryu to reason with him, but again, to no avail. By the end, it was just like, well, we ran out of lieutenants. Shibusawa, you're up. And then Shibusawa just goes, ah, yes, all according to Keikoku. I'm a brilliant mastermind and totally not obsessed with dragons, as if I were a Yakuza Seto Kaiba. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I don't know, it just, it, it doesn't feel right. Even though the fight itself is genuinely amazing, much like the boss theme. I know it feels harsh putting this in B tier for any hardcore Shibusawa fans, but again, I think we just have far too many dragons to deal with. Or maybe that's just me, right? Okay, on to Yakuza 6. We only have one piece to talk about, and it's Iwami's Hakutak. Once again, a being that you wouldn't immediately tie to Japanese mythos. Might symbolize how Iwami never really fit in with the lifestyle no matter how hard he tried. Apparently, the description of this creature is somewhat similar to that of a Kirin. Beings that live in isolation, but only appear under the reign of a just ruler. But I wouldn't really say that that fits Iwami. His dad could be labeled in many ways, but righteous isn't one of them. Hell, the world of the Yakuza just inches closer and closer to an inevitable collapse, as was shown in Yakuza 7, so this theming just falls upon deaf ears. Don't get me wrong, I love Iwami as the irredeemable scum of a villain, but his Irezumi isn't one I'd paid attention to. I think the design is cool, but that's about it. Let's go with C tier. Okay, finally, we've arrived at the last two entries. And what do you know, it's another dragon bonanza. First up, Tendo's dragon. It's basically like Shibusawa's, except looking more ominous and pointed upwards. Tendo is another character that I wish we got to see more of. The fight and boss theme were amazing, but the fact that we once again had to go with the dragon versus dragon thing really starts to get stale by now. Still, I feel like a B tier is a solid enough placement for this piece. Anyway, I purposefully saved Ichiban's ink for last, because it felt like a nice way to round up the whole list. You might think that I'd absolutely hate the design, considering what I've just said about the dragon invasion here, but surprisingly, I like this one quite a bit. When I heard that Ichiban was a massive fan of Dragon Quest, I immediately went, okay, please don't go with another dragon for the love of god. And while the reuse of Kiryu's dragon head still feels weird, the fact that they went with a hybrid motif caught me off guard in a really good way. Taking into account the fact that Ichiban's Seiyu is also Nishiki's, and also remembering the rags to riches approach the story takes once you wind up in Yokohama, the koi aspect gives a lot more meaning to it than something like Aizawa's koi or even Shibusawa's dragon. This is not the story that you're used to hearing. Ichiban is his own character through and through, and while he may make mistakes along the way, they will be uniquely his own. And even if he winds up developing similar delusions of grandeur by the end of this lengthy journey, if his Irezumi is anything to go by, he has a fighting chance to overcome these issues and actually become this almighty dragon that everyone and their mother strives to be. The only reason I'm putting this in A tier is because we've only seen one game with him as a lead. And I want to see if this positive trajectory that 7 started will continue with Like a Dragon 8. I have a lot of faith in the series moving forward, so I think this will easily go to an S tier in due time. So, there you have it. Looking at the list now, I genuinely feel bad for putting some Irezumi in anything lower than an S tier, because all of the art here is jaw-droppingly beautiful. But that wouldn't make for a fun tier list now, would it? Anyway, Thank you once again for the support you've shown, and for having reached this milestone with me. It makes the prospect of tackling more ambitious projects that much more exciting. Extra thanks goes to the wonderful people who become members of the channel as well. If you want to join, feel free to do so, but don't worry, I'll still be doing this content as long as I physically can, regardless. So, here's a toast to you all, and to whatever comes in the future. Until next time, Take care of yourselves and have a fantastic day. Cheers!